Hi, I'm Brett Warren, battered and jaded Star Wars fan. And in this one-off podcast discussion, I'll be joined by Nathan Parks to hopefully do our best to answer the question, what made Star Wars good in the first place? This discussion is based on a loose set of notes I've been keeping for the last couple of years, and was born out of the sad realization that Disney keeps finding new and creative nails to hammer into the coffin of Star Wars. Many fans assumed that episodes 1 through 3 had already scraped the bottom of the barrel, but Disney proved otherwise with the lore-crippling and cynical Last Jedi, the MacGuffin Hunt content conveyor belt that was Rise of Skywalker, and the ongoing embarrassing fan service generator that has been the Book of Boba Fett and sometimes Mandalorian. In theory, Star Wars could have simply evolved into a different stylistic entity while maintaining the trappings of the franchise, but hasn't. And this is mainly due to the fact that they've largely been failures of basic, competent filmmaking and storytelling. There have already been many great and insightful video essays and autopsies on all of these topics already, so I wanted to steer clear of that and simply return my focus back to the original films, going through them piece by piece in an attempt to understand what the gooey, magical center is of that trilogy. Because beyond the aesthetic and narrative failings of the new works, their main deficiency has been an empty emotional core, an almost total lack of resonance, where the parts rarely ever add up to any sort of sum. This discussion has nine sections that cover various aspects of filmmaking and art in general, and we'll be skipping right to the first. Because the original intro is really long and boring and went on a bunch of tangents. Okay, here we go. Good. Testing. Can you hear me? Blah, 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 blah. Volume, volume, volume. Okay. Let's test to see how angry we're going to get. What's the loudest and angriest we're going to get about Star Wars? Hello, listener. Star Wars. What happened? Uh, okay, there's that. That's the intro. (laughs) Garbage can man. (laughs) I love garbage can man. Sweet, sweet garbage can man. All right. Numero uno. Point one. Production design, visual aesthetic. <clears throat> All right, this, uh, whatever. I'll fix it in editing. Um, I tried to, uh, you know, I have everything in general bullet points. I've tried to organize my thoughts as best as possible from the pile of original notes. But uh, so a lot of this will be there'll be some redundancies or points that are that come back later on. Never, not everything's perfectly ordered. You should have made a crazy wall about it. <laughs> Strings attaching. I did in my mind. Oh, okay. All right, one, on the macro level. Remote, sparse, uncluttered. There is a just, like, going going back after, like, having not watched the original trilogy for, trilogy for a long time, my first takeaway was, oh, my God, nothing happens. That, that, that's not really true, but just compared to the visual noise, the narrative noise, the, the acting noise, there's just so much noise. But this is kind of a symptom of modern filmmaking, though. But there's just a certain amount of things that happen in a shot in the original Star Wars, just generally. like there, There's always just a certain amount of things that you put on screen, a, a nice kind of zen sparseness to original Star Wars. I mean, granted, there's a little bit more clutter in Return of the Jedi, but that's on the macro. In the micro, everything is covered in There's an insane amount of detail in the things that are in the frame. And generally, things are just covered in A high level of attention to detail on everything. Yeah, and just feel free to jump in anytime you want, but otherwise I'm just gonna rant. Um, Everything looks clunky and tangible. Uh, people are covered in Um, people are sweaty, dirty, um, most things should look dusty and greasy and sweaty. It was the 70s. Yes. Space 70s. Yeah. Some jank is okay. Junk, junk everywhere. The, The jankiness of Star Wars is a feature and not a detriment. It's not a shortcoming. It's baked into the movie. You can't clean up Star Wars. Like, Mm -hmm. the rough edges are what make it Star Wars. Dusty, greasy, sweaty, junk, junk everywhere. Everything, there's junk. Lots of junk. Yeah, things look old and, like, uh, inhabited and and lived. 
like they want you to live in the in the scenes more and not just have it speed by so quickly so streamlined dirty uh, it's a point i've seen other people make in like the few things i've seen about people trying to describe the original star wars is obviously the lived in aspect of it for some reason this never translates to any of the movies that have come out since mm -hmm. like yeah the sequel trilogy doesn't look as clean but it's still clean it's still way too clean but it's not like cartoony pristine like the prequels but it's still overly clean um here's a big one for me this this applies to the, the sequel trilogy disney star wars star wars is not the last of us it is not ruins chic it is not frontier chic Yes, it is sparse and dingy in places, but it's a functioning, inhabited galaxy. And it, this one's a little hard for me to, like, actually you know, describe what it is. It's just, this is the way Disney Star Wars comes across. It's, like, uncanny, like, overly designed to look a bit decimated. Mm -hmm. so, but it's just overly manicured. Yeah. In, in, like, an overly stylistic sense that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> To look, the lore. Look how dirty R2 is. Yeah. He's just always dirty. C-3PO. Plausible mechanical military outfitting. That's a big one that's missing. Fucking robots. Star Wars is robots. Clunky machines. that, But that still have some sort of basis in like 80s retro futurism. It's like something that still looks like it has some tangible basis in like 70s, 80s military outfitting there, there isn't some kind of logical leap of like the how does this work mm -hmm. dirt padding and functionality in costume design uh wait do i have a whole section for costume design <laughs> i thought i had a whole you got a, a glossary an index for that oh thing. so i'm already on costume design then. oh <laughs> costume design maybe i already have a section for it but anyway yeah Okay, the costume design, this is one where I do have to talk about the sequel trilogy. Again, the prequel trilogy, it's all very carefully manicured to look kind of, like, classical. And it's all very clean, but it's all meant to have a certain style, where the sequel trilogy is, like, doing this overly chic bastardization of the original films, where it's in the general ballpark, but it is god-awful costume design the original trilogy dirt padding functionality it, yeah it's simple but there should be dirt on it and there should be at least a like functional padding with pockets but in this in the sequel trilogy you have like just these dumb little superfluous designs on on costumes don't let fashion designers make star wars costumes <laughs> because that's what the sequel trilogy looks like yeah um the dry look mutton chops this is one of your points is this here's a direct quote from nathan star wars people should look like sweet disco dancers <laughs> it's always the late 70s early 80s in space that was another thing rogue one got right whether it was a conscious choice or more because of the necessity of we have to do this because we're shoehorning a movie right before A New Hope. Basically 1980s retrofuturism. Or at the time it was just, you know. Star Wars humans should generally be unattractive looking, not Urban Outfitters catalog models. Yeah. That's something I've noticed watching the sequel trilogy uh, is you look at anyone in the backgrounds of any scenes, they're all models. Everyone's way too good looking, way too young. There's no old crusty men with giant hideous hair. Like, you need ugly British people. Like, no offense, <laughs> Brits. I, I, I think some of them are American too, but just ugly 70s people. And may, maybe everyone's just too good looking now. Like, the gene yeah. pool has... It's evened out. It's really evened but out. Yeah, just, you have to find ugly people <clears throat> to be in Star Wars. Or just at least eccentric looking people, not people who just have like this bland, like, you know, catalog model sort of general attractiveness. It's, it becomes really distracting and doesn't feel like an inhabited world. Like, especially in like the military aspect of th the sequel trilogy, where it looks like a bunch of catalog models. Like, this is not a military. And you generally have this feeling of why does this feel like cosplay? It's because it looks like cosplay.
Yeah, don't let fashion design... Build everything that can be built. Everything. Oh, yeah. Cycling back. This was another one of the disclaimers. This is never going to happen. Ever. This is more of, it can be done, but it's never going to happen. It's, it's just not. And this is part of... This is one of the big reasons, is you have to build everything. Physical and in-camera effects force you into a more creative framing of shots. Yeah. I'll get more into this in one of the later points anyway here. Um, yeah, optical compositing. Again, the visual jank of, like, having to do things in camera. It looks tangible. It feels tangible. And I just have written here four words. Wind, smoke, fog, dust. <laughs> things that are largely missing from every other Star Wars movie. People just need to get dirty, and there needs to be smoke and atmospheric effects. We need Luke to kick the dirt when he's mad about his, yeah. his you know, like actual <clears throat> real dirt cloud coming from his feet when his, his uh, aunt and uncle are killed. Mm -hmm. Subsection B. Image quality. Physical models. Build everything. Matte paintings. In-camera effects. Basically, just the way they made it then, it's not a detriment. It's part yeah. of the feature and part of the allure, part of the visual tangibility. Remember how cool Cloud City looked? Yeah. Oh, man, so cool. Uh, CGI is not good at visual depth. Um, the human eye does not see its environment with clarity most of the time. Your surroundings, especially at any distance, is almost always out of focus. People don't see in 2020, and yet when you watch a movie with pristine CG, everything is too crisp, too in focus. Or perfectly out of focus. <laughs> yeah, to the, like, the human eye does not see this way, so yeah. it just looks flat. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, CGI is not good at visual depth. Its lines are almost always too clean, sharp, and uniform. Visual dirt and noise are important. Uh, blur is good. The way that we see and the way that our brain works is just too discerning. If an object or an image hasn't occupied physical space at some point, some aspect of it is going to come across as off and distracting. Yeah. So even though they filmed uh, the sequel trilogy, and you know, most of the Disney ones are filmed in on, on film, it helps to a certain degree. It can only provide so much layering like very little it's just it's at least at the bare minimum going to give you some of the little textural stuff just at the very front textual variation impressionism the painterly effect that come with all of the previous things i've mentioned like yeah visual compositing uh matte painting like all of these things provide a layer of of just kind of uh, an impressionistic painterly depth to an image um, seams and layers are good. Because I remember, like, always wanting, like, yes, yes, I need, like, a more, like, a more scrubbed, sanitized version of the Star Wars movies. And you don't know why you want it. It's just like, oh, I, want, I just want more visual quality. And then, like, as I've gotten older, I want all the crappiness. I, mm -hmm. uh, and I think some people are feeling the same way of, of liking, like, you see in, like, indie games and, like, music videos and kind of, like, the, the 80s new wave like just throwback culture stuff people are starting to appreciate visual infidelity yeah. <laughs> uh, more and more which i think is good so yes those things are interesting because we see l real life with nothing in between you generally you watch a movie to give you an interesting visual texture to something that you don't usually see um Scenes with heavy CG elements are too fluid. Pacing and scene slash shot punctuation are partially achieved by the parts you don't show or can't show or include. So there's like a, a choppy element to things that give things a, a certain flow within a scene. This one's a little more nebulous. I didn't think it through, but <laughs> hopefully you can connect those dots. Uh, it gives the originals and older genre films in general, a more graphic novel feel. The visual jank in Star Wars is a feature, not a shortcoming. Part B continued. Lighting. 
This one was a little hard for me because this is way beyond my expertise. I don't have any expertise, but way beyond whatever I was able to really piece together. So lighting. One, sunlight. Actual shadows. Here's a huge one I've noticed. I'm pretty sure in the Disney Star Wars movies that they don't use a, a, a light box. Is that what it's called? When, when you stand next to an actor with like the reflective thing. I'm pretty sure they don't use those because I never saw one in the behind the scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. And they never shoot at the proper time of day, like hardly ever. So besides the fact that there's always this, this like horrible post-processing to the movies for the most part, even when they're shooting just outdoors during the day, you can't see people's faces. Like nothing is defined. Do you think they just film during the golden hour with as little shadow as possible? Or? It always looks overcast. Like everything outdoors in the sequel trilogy or just Disney Star Wars, it always looks overcast. Everything is just extremely muddled. Like there's no shadows, hardly ever. Natural lighting and color palette. Shoot at the right time of day. This is just general filmmaking competence. <laughs> like just... <laughs> Make sure that you can see people's faces and that there's good lighting. <laughs> Light elements in a frame so that they actually stand out and are well-defined. Please stop with oversaturation slash desaturation. The gray washing, post-processing, the weird hyperactive mood lighting. I don't know, J.J. Abrams, uh, lens flare. <laughs> but he loves putting like a blue f or green filter on mm -hmm. everything. Constant dramatic high contrast in in the sequels where uh, everything is like shot like high concept so that none of it ever stands out it's the white noise effect where in the prequel trilogy and the disney plus shows there's no visual flair to anything it's all just like stock standard the world's most generic lighting uh in disney star wars everything has a flat dull ambient teal haze to it and it's generally underlit yeah, so high, dramatic high concept contrast should be reserved for important scenes so that you actually notice it when it shows up. Uh, but th this is another symptom of modern film is like synth, just general sensory white noise effect yeah. of there's never any downtime with anything like narratively or visually. So it all just becomes a non-factor. And fuck off with lens flare. That was another... All right, indoors, just white overhead soundstage lighting. That's it. When you're indoors, it should just be white, glaring soundstage lighting. Overhead. Bright, clear, white. That's it. Unless a scene calls for it, and you specifically need good mood lighting, like Luke versus Vader on in Cloud City. That has amazing mood lighting. And the mood lighting in that works because there's specific points of, of light. It's not just, here's a post-production effect gloss that we're putting on stuff. It's, here's a light source that's specifically placed somewhere to give an, a, a certain effect that draws your eye to a certain part of the frame. Using something for a purpose. Uh, yes, defined shot elements, purpose, purposefully chosen lighting. Just making choices with lighting instead of just, here's some colors. And they're sort of symmetrically arranged uh, shot composition. Great. Specific, give scenery definite and specific light sources that draw attention to elements within a shot. I already said that. All right. All right, that was part two. These look pretty part good. Three. Number two. World building slash narrative. A.K.A. Very Little Happens. Star Wars is really boring. <laughs> so boring. The original Star Wars film... Save the Princess. This so, is a very boring story. So little. It's the greatest stoner movie of all time. Yeah, no, yeah. very little happens. There's not a shit ton of scene changes. Living in those scenes is what really matters. There's, there's, I think there's a Hollywood groupthink... They, they they think they can do whatever and that their decisions are what people like and I don't understand. We like when less stuff happens and it doesn't need to be thrown in your face about all the possibilities. The Jedis are magical. 
and uh, superheroes, like you always say. We'll get to that. All right. You're jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the human... Oh, yeah, you just said it. But the human brain can only remember focus on a handful of elements. <clears throat> the original trilogy gets to the f***ing point. Fluid simplicity of movement from plot beat to plot beat. They just let things soak. Because in real life, people mostly just putter around. Like, real life is super uneventful. And in the original Star Wars gotta keep busy. movies, people are mostly puttering about. Again, this is just competent filmmaking in general, but each scene having a point, an emotional point, a beginning and an end. And then letting the scene play out. Just letting the scene play out. Instead of, oh my god, we have to rush through this to get to the next thing. Like, there is almost a zen art to the original Star Wars, uh, the first two, where the movie has enough confidence in itself to not do anything sometimes. Mm -hmm. And there's just a beauty to that. Uh, time between plot points significantly slower than any of the other Star Wars film. Like, dramatically slower. Yeah. Yeah, like, just the amount of things that happen, like, I'm not going to use it for this discussion, but, like, I, like, did a little crappy visual mapping out of just the things that happen, just the general plot points of every one of the Star Wars movies, and it just becomes increasingly more cluttered. This is, like, the original is by far the most streamlined, where it just goes from point A to point B, and then, like, nothing really breaks off. There's hardly any tangents. At most, you're ever getting, like, two simultaneous uh, things happening. Like, like here, like, Tarkin addressing the, uh, the this Imperial Council is, like, the other thing happening while Luke learns about the Force from Obi-Wan. Mm -hmm. Like, two things. Two. Two max. Max as the rule. Um, uh, sparse... Oh, wait. Right, okay. Sparse, but plot points still unfold quickly which is kind of part of there not being a whole lot happening it's, it feels slow but it still efficiently gets from one point to the next because there's not a shit ton of other little pointless things that they're they have to do within a, a two or three scene span um when things i don't know why i put these in quotations but when <laughs> things air quote happen, air quote, they're actually given space to breathe and be explored. When action scenes happen, air quotes, I don't know why I'm putting quotes on everything. When action scenes happen, they actually stand out and are memorable because they have contrast. Mm -hmm. Double underline. Contrast. To all modern filmmaking. Contrast. <laughs> Important. They function as a crescendo. Because people aren't just running around like manic weirdos the whole time. Why do, Why does this need to be explained to people? I don't know. That things need a background in order for you to notice them. So for yeah, some yeah. reason, people don't notice the white noise effect. They just want things happening all the time. But you don't notice when a thing happens when everything is happening all the time. You only notice something's happened because there's been downtime. <sighs> It's just like art 101, basically. Like, let's go back to the <laughs> absolute basics. You need a canvas in order to make <laughs> art on something. <laughs> you can't stack a canvas on top of a canvas. <laughs> All right. Um, almost every scene has a specific dramatic function, uh, whether for the character or just the stakes of the film in general. Very few... Lo oh, yeah, there's a huge one. Very few locations. Here's this for the audience's sake. All right, I went through and just put three categories for all of the Star Wars movies. Urban, rural, and space. I know a number of locations. I, I know, like, a lot of these kind of blend together, but if it's on a starship, if you can generally see a star field at any point, that's space. If they're on, like, a smaller spaceship, that's space. Rural is, like, if it's just mostly an uninhabited type of naturalistic place. Urban is if, you know, there's a lot of, lots of people, an inhabited area. So this is all very general, but it gives you a general idea. The original Star Wars, 43 minutes urban, 54 minutes rural, 
22 minutes space, four locations. Empire, 54 minutes urban, 41 minutes rural, 20 minutes space, five locations. Jedi, 45 minutes urban, 53 minutes rural, 13 minutes space, five locations. The only other one that's close in all of the other movies is uh, Phantom Menace and Force Awakens, which I would generally put is like the next best ones. But even Phantom Menace, actually the whole prequel trilogy as a whole is too, way too heavy on urban environments and has v very little space. So like Phantom Menace is 60, 45, 10, five locations. So it's at least location-wise. It's a bit understandable since they were the, yeah, the old Republic. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's before collapsing. So, yeah, and... it's a little understandable. So like the locations and the amount of locations in the prequels is generally in the ballpark. So Attack of the Clones, you have... 60, 45, f yeah, <laughs> five minutes of space in Attack of the Clones. And I think it's just that <laughs> scene where Obi-Wan gets chased by Jango Fett. Six locations. Uh, Revenge of the Sith, 80 minutes, 80, yeah, it's really heavy on just the urban stuff. 30 minutes rural, but that's arguable because it's that one weird, like, whole, uh, that, that one planet where Obi-Wan fights Grievous, where oh, yeah. it's like, it's that big hole in the ground thing. Mm -hmm. So that, I don't know. I, I just counted that as rural in 10 minutes of space. But that, that again only has five locations, but there's a huge asterisk next to that because it feels like they're going back and forth and it starts to become really like convoluted and cluttered, like where they're going and when, because it's constantly cutting back from planet to planet. So that's a huge asterisk. The sequel trilogy, 41, 45, 24, seven locations, Last Jedi, 28, 54, 45 minutes of space. That's why the movie feels more like a Battlestar Galactica episode. Way, way too f***ing much in <laughs> six locations. Uh, Rise of Skywalker goes completely off the f***ing ch chain. 24 minutes urban, 75 minutes rural, and only 11 minutes of space time. Rogue One is 38, 55, 29, nine locations. That's like the huge detriment to that otherwise okay movie. Yeah. Solo is 48, 66, 18, and 7. So, yeah, like... That was a MacGuffin hunt, I mean... Yeah, so you see a general correlation of... If it generally sticks to the, the, the pattern of, of, like, the division of locales in the amount of locales, as laid out by the original trilogy, it tends to be better... Cool space bars, too. You need cool, cool sp space bars. Space bars. And werewolves. <laughs> With glowing eyes. Very few locations. Very few major story developments. Uh, few lengthy stretches of dialogue. And when they are there, they're generally meaningful teaching moments. Like, generally, Obi-Wan with Vader, Obi-Wan, or any of his mentors, or his dad. Generally, you just don't have long conversations at any point. Um, clear, concise, simple world building between significant plot points. Uh, paced introduction of new elements feel like cameos and never overstay their welcome. Yeah, like cool world building stuff. Just obviously the biggest one is like an empire, the the bounty hunters. You want to talk about them? Why that's oh, yeah. fucking sweet. I, I, I don't one. even know if there's an answer to that. They're just so cool. Because, or, or, Bo or Boba Fett in general. Like, yeah, just like minor world building that doesn't overstay its welcome. Like with Boba Fett, yeah, the bounty hunters, things that just show up. That, the scene on Empire of them <clears throat> meeting with Darth Vader, the bounty hunters, just a scene. They're standing around. Nothing yeah. happens. Why did every boy my age think that was the coolest scene? Nothing happened. It was just... I don't know. It, it, there, there's, I can't even describe why that's cool, actually. Be, because, m like, most things in Star Wars are generally better imagined than actually seen. We'll get to that when it comes to the Jedi. But, like, with the bounty hunters, the scene is cool because it's, oh my god, things have gotten so bad for the Empire, they have to resort to these monsters. And so what's cool is your imagination is almost always better than anything you actually, yeah. like, see. So just the hint of of these monsters 
that suddenly appearing on what was otherwise this clean, whitewashed, imperial Star Destroyer is like, oh, sweet, and it fires the imagination. It's good narrative shorthand. It implies the Empire's desperation, conveys a lot without having to do much. It's screenwriting jujitsu. And another really small one is in the Battle of Hoth, you see, you see like less than two seconds of one of the chicken walkers, the ATSTs, just in the background. They built that just to be shown for like two seconds. Yeah. And it doesn't show up was again that, until the next movie. Is that a stop motion thing? Yeah, they were cool. Like sometimes I forget it's even there, which is like small stuff or like, yeah, just like small throwaway things that eventually make another reappearance, but don't need like their whole, like a whole separate storyline or to be fleshed out. Like, mm -hmm. like just that kind of cool world building. And I'm sure I'm missing some examples, but maybe the, the fact that they had to build all of the sets before computers and like, they really had to milk uh, cinematography and just the mood of, of those scenes, you know, Hoth was the coolest scene of all time. Oh, oh, here, here's an example of like, th there's deleted scenes of empire where the with the wampa attack where the wampas actually attack the base they get into the base again that that would have been dramatically less cool than oh look there's like 5 seconds of this wampa in the cave that's significantly cooler than seeing like 5 of them bust through and yeah pe people are over their the like their situations they, it's realistic they've dealt with their reality and they're not trying to throw it in our face all the time that's just like what they know very subtle stuff I don't, I don't want to skip over anything because i've spent months doing this okay part two, uh yeah continued uh teasing is always cooler than inundating or overexposing mm -hmm. too little is always better than too much Mo well 99 percent of the time no huddle scenes this is something that plagues definitely the prequel and sequel trilogy sequel trilogy just being worse at everything but like characters constantly gathering together for exposition dumps like in the prequel trilogy whenever two jedi are just walking around and they start to explain what they're going to do next like walking down a hallway boringly like oh did you know this thing's happening on this planet or people discussing things before they do it. This just ends up being a huge waste of f***ing time. Uh, scenes just play out. Because it's an inhabited world and they're not putting on a stage production. Scenes play out and the filmmaker can trust that we can follow what's f***ing happening. F*** off with the overbearing narrative hand and with pandering. Just let stuff happen. Brevity, the lost art of brevity. Setups and payoffs are clear. Anyway, sorry, back to the <laughs> world building thing. Uh, like one, Han always fixing the Falcon is visual sh and narrative shorthand for the Rebellion's material inferior inferiority. Right, the bounty hunter scene we already talked about. ATST showing up. Uh, Dangar. Yeah, yeah, I didn't notice that until recently. Dangar. It's not just Boba Fett. Like, Dangar, who's another one of the bounty hunters on the the ex Executor, I think that was I think that was Vader's ship that they're on. He Anyway, he's in Jabba's palace. And then a scout trooper holding Han's blaster. It's very subtle, but cool. <laughs> um, all right. We're making decent time. It's got motorcycle gloves on. I only need half a glove. That's another weird thing is, like, the actor they got for... Chewbacca in sequel trilogy, he's way too small. <laughs> it's like distracting how much smaller he is. They couldn't have got a basketball, like an NBA person for that. Well, that that's fucking weird. I had seen Last Jedi like four or five times before I noticed that Chewbacca was on the planet with them, with Rey and Luke on that island planet. He's there with them. And he's just sitting, he's, he's like sitting there while they're having like their little Padawan discussion or whatever. I had huh. never noticed that. He, he's just sitting there like see, like furniture. And my brain had just <laughs> like scrubbed him out of the scene. I mean, I did, I did remember when he tried to eat the porg, but like... All right, yeah. But like my brain just didn't connect him to being in that movie. Holy <laughs> shit. 
<laughs> that was so weird. Yeah, I barely remember that. They're not memorable. Chapter three. You can't be. It can't be memorable when scenes switch so fast. You need time. Chapter three. Mood, tone, and ambiance. Mystery. I just have this in bold and underlined. Mystery. Again, in parentheses. The lost art of... Or this is probably the most important section of this for me. Is This is kind of the intangibles here. Just mystery. Uh, isolation versus technical oppression. Um, the distant narrative hand, like we've already said. Giving scenes, breathing room time, downtime. Just... The sense that you're in an inhabited, kind of beleaguered, constantly at war galaxy, which helps the the authenticness. It helps the world building feel more authentic, autonomous, lived in. Allows set pieces to stand out more. Um, let the environment speak. Let it simmer. Just hold on a shot, like anything. Just just anything in a fucking frame. Just I want that in any Hollywood movie. Just just hold on a shot. Like please. please. Please quit oh, cutting God. every two seconds. Just cutting, cut, cutting, cutting. Yeah, you need someone on set who, who just yells, Blade Runner! <laughs> and you just hold on something. Just for like two f***ing seconds. Oh my God. <laughs> here's, here's the real big ones. Danger. Escapes, odds, and stakes. So now we're getting into like the, the real sort of meat of the original trilogy. Yeah, uh... The feeling of imminent danger, impending doom, insurmountable odds. Everything in the original Star Wars trilogy is basically an escape. Like, almost every scene is, like, punctuated by an escape. Yeah. There's always this this feeling of danger and odds. Han isn't just saying that. Like, there, it's always being on the verge of being crushed by this sort of faceless, soulless, technological behemoth. And just the feeling that you're always getting out by, like, the hair of your teeth. Uh, here's what lends itself to, like, the idea of mystery is the background unease. And th I'll largely get into that with, like, talking about, like, how characters act. But, it, like, Star Wars media used to be really good at it. The Star Wars universe for me, like, at its best always felt, like, dangerous and kind of quiet and mysterious. There's always something in the background, like, a little bit haunting. There's always kind of this quiet, un intangible element in the background, like some, like it's not 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 just the Force, but like, like almost like Star Wars almost has its own kind of Cthulhu or like H.P. Lovecraft, like like something off, like something underneath everything that's very ominous. I think any good fictional mythology has a central resonance to it, a soul where all the pieces coalesce to inspire its own unique, distinct emotional response in the audience. Uh, urgency. Clear stakes. Star Wars should be a little scary. There should always be this sense of, like, somber desperation with that never goes too far, that always has its occasional caps of sentimentality. It's kind of sad and lonely, but with always the sense of romance. Like, that's a huge thing that's missing from all other Star Wars is just the sense of mystery and romance. But then, so you start to get in like the really uh, nebulous kind of intangible things here. Like, what is romance? Like It's Harrison Ford. What are you talking about? He's the, yeah, the in the kind, dictionary. Kind of like a fairy tale or... Uh, I think a lot of it is is that spirit of the adventure serial. Like, of course, of course some of the dialogue is going to be campy and because yeah. that's part of what George Lucas was going for was a, a, a modern reinvention of the 20s and 30s serials. And 1940s. Where everything is sort of big and swashbuckling. And which Han is, Solo talks about how he doesn't know about that four stuff because he's good with a blaster by his side. And he's very, he's very a romantic hero, really. Some cuteness works because innocence, wonder, and mystery are all connected feelings, so that's why I'm okay with Ewoks. Some <laughs> cuteness. Just keep it fucking sparse. And another word I have here, but also a question mark, is enchantment. Again, the fairy tale thing, especially when you're getting into like Empire Strikes Back or why the whole Dagobah and Yoda thing works so well. 
It's because it's basically shot like it's it's a fairy tale. Like this idea of of going into some mysterious setting, being there for a while, and then when we get into music, like obviously that's a huge portion of all of of, of that. Like music does the best job of conveying the sense of wonder and whimsy and uh, enchantment. Obviously, sentimental music, like a soft glow of lighting, holding on a medium shot. That, that's something you, you hardly ever get in any of the other Star Wars movies. It's just like a medium establishing shot. Like, you just rarely get establishing shots. Yeah. Ever. Like, it's so weird. Like, just an establishing shot to say, hey, you are now entering into a new scene. Something, especially if it's something like Dagobah, where it's like, ooh... Like you're being, you're coming in from a distance. Musical cues. It's bringing you in psychologically. Whimsical entry points to scenes, meeting eccentric creatures, adventure. Adventure. Yes, this is, <sighs> that's an enormous missing piece from everything outside of the original trilogy is trying to define what adventure means. I think it's, it's the contrasting emotions of Fear, hope, possibility, ambiguity, sadness. All of these things kind of just juxtaposed together and venturing off into the unknown instead of just a fucking MacGuffin hunt. The world is already in motion. Whatever. They're over it. People uh, people in the 70s were over it. <laughs> they're over it. And they're all... They're just going. They're all, they're all very high as well. And like, as they save the galaxy, they're kind of like, ah, okay, fine. Yes. Like that's a better way to go. And we will get to that in two more <laughs> hours when we get to characters. Only two more hours. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and we're back. Part four. Action. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, like, another cool subtle world-building thing is just them being in the Stormtrooper costumes. Like, that's cool. But they don't have to make a whole thing out of it. They didn't. They didn't have to make a whole thing out of it. Right, part four, action. Um, all right, ground battles. Close quarters, very close quarters. Lots of smoke. People sort of stumbling around, haphazardly f firing blasters. Lots of smoke. Lots of sparks, sizzles, explosions. Just big, sizzly explosives every time you shoot something loud. Very f***ing loud. Um, hold on. Uh, okay, that, that's late. Because blasters only have a couple of shots, right? I mean, where's the energy come from? It's... <laughs> right. Like, again, we'll get to the lightsabers, but with blasters, yeah, they just feel, like, explosive and dangerous. Like... You have a mi yeah a, a minimum amount of shots like th this doesn't need to be said but there should not be rockets or machine guns in Star Wars like that one dude in Rogue One who has like the Gatling gun mm -hmm. like no it should be really sparse like it has to build up energy to fire off like like one or two fucking shots. Stop trying to make blaster fights look like Rainbow Six. It's not modern special ops. Shoot from the hip. Do not aim. It's all very haphazard. It should be sloppy and explosive. So, lots of running away. Running away all the time. Just running. Running for your f***ing <laughs> life. Big ass, sparky, smoky explosions. In flight combat, here's one I'm very passionate about. Cockpit chatter. The only movie that does this right is Rogue <laughs> One. It's the only one that f***ing does it right. It should be like World War II dogfights. It should be like actual coordinated military dogfighting where people chatter nervously. Uh, it, it, the cockpit ch chatter helps with stakes and logistics. It, it creates a, a, a whole, uh, just a general overlay of what the stakes are and subtle character building of, oh, hey, here's, here's this guy who happens to say a thing. Like, you'll, you'll occasionally get that in the sequel trilogy. Like, in, in the prequel trilogy, there's hardly any like aerial dogfighting at all but like in the sequel trilogy like you'll occasionally get someone saying something like some side character x-wing pilot or whatever kind of saying something but it's never like in coordination with the combat it's always like 
hey guys, let's go down here and do this thing. <laughs> it's like space combat should feel like a naval battle. It should it should feel like the Battle of Midway, do- World War II dogfights, lo-fi radio chatter, staticky lo-fi radio chatter, concise, dispassionate. Another big one is the the, the sense of movement and speed, which again sort of goes back to how with with like with CG you can too clearly make like the image of of like an X-wing flying through space or any ship it always feels too fluid like the coolest space action scene in all of Star Wars is just at the very beginning of the battle of Endor when all of the tie fighters just come out from uh, there's there's the line of of star destroyers and you see the flood of tie fighters just coming at you but because you can't do something perfectly from like its inception on the horizon to when it disappears like past you in the frame there, there's a, there's a choppiness where you can only show like so much of its of it kind of appears out of nowhere like a ship will if you're really looking closely they kind of pops up out of nowhere but that that adds to the sense of like rapidity and movement and speed in space combat Space should be bumpy. They're constantly being knocked around, thrown around, ships getting blown, blown shit. Ships should go ridiculously fast. Uh, uh, I don't know, George Lucas talks about his love of racing and just moving, like with the pod race or American graffiti, just, or like a lot of the stuff in Temple of Doom. Like a lot of his movies have some sort of like racing element, just. Yeah, the mechanics of military engagement are important because it's called Star Wars. Plausible military tactics slash organization. Danger. People get sweaty, bruised, and hurt. Strategy. Little guys on the run. A sense of overwhelming, insurmountable odds and imminent danger, which I'll probably keep reiterating again and again, but that's it. That's a huge puzzle piece of oh my god, anything could collapse at any moment. People are barely escaping any given situation. Oh, this is a quote from Mark Hamill from the Return of the Jedi documentary. He says, The Star Wars style is based on two things. The editing, pace of sequences, and the speed of movement through the frame. Um, You have to parse that as you will. (laughs) Uh, Star Wars is a series of escapes. Bombast, confined chaos... Action beats are fast, loud, are fast and loud. Swashbuckling. This is a huge, huge one that goes back to the uh, its its lineage of from the uh, adventure serials of the twenties and thirties and kind of in the forties. Uh, swashbuckling. The point right before the raft goes over the waterfall. The oh my god, we're about to go over the cliff feeling. Yeah, so it's like defining what what what's swashbuckling like. What would you imagine of, yeah, people swinging like I get in here. We it just happened like Luke and Leia swinging across the, the yeah, sarcasm. Yeah, swinging whatever them swinging, and then it was it was Carrie Fisher's idea to give Luke a little smooch right before they, like it's so subtle, but it's like okay, they're not just brushing over. It's like. It's so tame by today's movie standards. It's like, great. They're just swinging across a thing. It's a big deal for a normal person. Yeah, yeah. Just an everyday average person. I mean, swinging across a chasm is a huge deal. Yeah, and it's that subtle punctuation of... I I think she says good luck to him or whatever. She she smooshes him, and it's like, here we go. Um... Okay, lightsaber battles. I'll get I'll get more into lightsaber stuff. It has its whole sub own subsection, but for lightsaber battles, they need pauses and variation. Again, contrast. This is really important for lightsaber battles. The lightsaber battles are not there for a show. Yes, they're fun to watch, but they're there for character development. The mm-hmm. lights lightsaber is tangential. Yeah, largely. They should be for they, they should be a climactic showcase for interpersonal drama slash conflict, not just a dance or obligatory lightsaber time. Um, light. Oh, here's I'm very passionate about this one. 
And I know a lot of people will disagree because they love the Duel of the Fates ballet. Lightsabers should be broadswords, not katanas. It should be largely influenced by European swordsmanship with a little bit of kendo, I guess. Like, like the, uh, so, like, the Japanese element would be, like, the ceremony of it. So, like, a little bit of the ceremony of we are engaging in a, you know, weapon-to-weapon combat, but largely should be a heavy, broadsworded weapon. And that's in contrast to the prequel trilogy, which, I don't know, through my research, it was based on Wushu, which is more of, like, the crouching tiger, hidden dragon style of flippy sword. Open doors, you can do anything. Open your soup can... Use lightsabers for everything. It's a lightsaber-based society. So, like, in the sequel trilogy, they went, they got a little bit better about it, where it's not just a dance, but they went too far in the other direction. Well, it's too much of a mixture of it, where it's too much of a mixture, but also in the wrong direction, where, like, the lightsabers feel heavier again, but it's still too clumsy-looking, where it's, like, too clumsy and brutal where it, most of the time it looks like they're just flinging around their lightsabers. So it's lacking that ceremony. So I guess you, like it's happening right now. We just have it on the background of Star Wars 77. Here's Vader versus, you know, Obi-Wan. Like, this fight's irrelevant. Like, it's just... It's Obi-Wan suicide. Yeah, it's... Right. A, yeah, Cry it, for help. It's irrelevant. I don't know why people bitch about this. Like, who cares? I, I've seen something where someone's like... Where someone made, like, a reinterpretation of it where they're just basically flipping around and doing all his acrobatics. Like, you're missing the f***ing point. Like, this has nothing to do with the fight itself. Yeah, they're just having a conversation here. One, it was the novelty of the lightsaber. Yes, there's limitations of the time, but it was mostly just the novelty of the lightsaber, seeing it for the first time in action, and seeing Luke's mentor finally confronting the ultimate evil. That's it. It's a character development point. Who gives a so they're not katanas, they're broadswords. They should appear to have heft and weight and shouldn't be on for more than 10 seconds outside of duels. Even that. I think that's too much, actually. They like, should have made a rule where they explode after 10 seconds. <laughs> There's so much energy. It's like, oh, <laughs> power is bitch down. As with everything regarding the Jedi and Star Wars in general, less is more. Okay, the, 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 uh, the prequels were too much of a fluid, sterile dance, like just emotionless. It was a ballet. The sequels, too much weight, too much flailing, too clunky, and there's no ceremony. Both of those prequels and sequels, both based too much in Chinese martial arts, and neither of those series have any good inter storytelling or subtlety. Nope. You, like, you need to stop every once in a while. Have, like, minor points for dialogue. Yeah, just f***ing stand there every once in a while. Like this. <laughs> while stormtroopers are trotting slowly around. Hey, what's this? Oh, yeah, here's another question. How come all the stormtroopers <laughs> are American? Is it like w- when you go up in the ranks, Yeah. <laughs> you get a British accent? And you know, you know if it's a really low, uh, low-level imperial officer, if they still have an American accent, like you should work on your diction, <laughs> bitch. I like how Darth Vader kicks Obi Wan's. Uh, he like steps on his. Outfit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's Just like, to see. If it's like, <laughs> are you under there? Where do you, where do you go? <laughs> we gotta crank this thing. Come on, Chewie. <laughs> see, it's like ah, oh, sweaty and blah, run. <laughs> A uh, dual escalation is important. It starts off ceremonial, where they're sizing each other up, and then by the end becomes brutal. It's like any fight where you're feeling someone out, you're feeling someone out, and then eventually it starts to dissolve into the, you know, sweats and cuts and death. All right. Uh, oh, lightsaber continued. Uh, oh, here's a quote from George Lucas, who apparently forgot his own thoughts. <laughs> uh, it was more of a symbol than it was an actual weapon in the movie. That was George Lucas on the lightsaber featurette documentary. Symbol. It was more a symbol. of a. It was more of a symbol than it was an actual weapon in the movie. 
Exactly. Good job, George. Uh, here's a <laughs> quote from Mark Hamill. George was adamant that these things were really heavy, that we couldn't take a hand off. We always had to have two. It was like Excalibur. I didn't have the whole quote, but he, I think he went on to say, like, that describing it as George describing it to him as like that this weapon was pulsating like this a lot of energy and was really hard to control mm -hmm. and that's what makes it feel tangible and brutal and cool yeah not like a magic stick that you flip around like a fucking parade baton or used as a freaking flashlight like that cave worm scene in rise of skywalker all right now we're part five the Force slash Jedi. The Force is philosophical. It's a path of wisdom and guidance, not a fucking conduit for superpowers. I feel like I'm being really condescending. But <laughs> it just needs, like, I need my tone no, somebody to reiterate. Needs, uh, <laughs> people need to know, I mean. Damn it, right the premises. <laughs> That's what I sat there saying was, Rebel escaped the premises. <laughs> that droid was cool. Mm -hmm. Hoth. What was, I think if we just analyzed Hoth, the Hoth scenes. Yeah, it's, it's the it's, best part of it, any movie. It's a master class in fantasy. <laughs> but like, why is just that one droid so cool? Like, there's nothing just that cool in any of the other Star Wars movies. Why is Boba Fett that cool? It's indescribable. Because it's the only thing in the frame, and it's like, hey, there's a thing I can focus on. Like, so you can actually think about the thing you're seeing instead of, like, there's five that. If this was made now, there'd be 5,000 of those Imperial <laughs> probe droids. Yeah. There'd be, like, a whole sea of them. Um, the Force abilities are largely tangential. The Force is a signpost on the hero's journey. The Force is about character assessment, not power measurement. The Jedi path is... It's about the importance of overcoming failure and dealing with emotion. That's all it is. Like, it's just... It's just a, like, a... A, a, a fictional embodiment, a mythological embodiment of the inner turmoil of going from, of, of taking any journey in life and like Luke's journey of dealing with a parent as they grow up and dealing with their future, you know, teenage angst, which is why this, why Star Wars resonated so much at the time, you know, with like the 60s generation and, you know, dealing with all of that shit. It's about the importance of overcoming failure and dealing with emotion, about self-control. It's a test of character. It's about... What the fuck was that? It's about emotions. And I underlined that. Like, the powers are tangential. It's about the journey. It's about... Yeah, it's about the, the, the philosophical implications of how one deals with one's emotions. It should be rooted in more of Eastern philosophy not just be about magical wizards or ninjas, like space ninjas, doing cool shit. They're not superheroes. The Force is most interesting in its quiet, character-driven moments. Do you have anything to say? No, I, I feel like I was, I was onto something, but I drank, I drank too much. <laughs> I did feel like I had something there. Man, damn it. Carrie Fisher was hot. Yeah, she's cute. In this, this whole scene, in this really, I mean... You mean? Plus making out with your brother. You need? What about... What about... And what am, precisely am I supposed to know? It's the way you feel about me. Come on, bitch. Aha, uh -huh, see? We were going to do a podcast, but we got distracted. That can watching. be arranged. <laughs> um, talking about the lore, nature of the Force is usually more interesting than seeing the manifestation of its powers. For every display of force power, there should be twice as much talking about it. Yeah. Right, okay. Here's Jedi powers in the movies. In the original Star Wars, like, here's all the things that happen. There's very little, like, displays of the force in the original trilogy. In the first one, Luke ignites, Luke ignites Anakin's lightsaber. Obi-Wan does two Jedi mind tricks. There's the Vader-Obi-Wan duel... Obi-Wan vanishes, I guess that's a power right, or it's a manifestation of the Force. Luke technically uses it to blow up the Death Star, uh, Vader forks, Force chokes somebody, and like Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan 
uses force sense, I guess, and that's it. Yeah, it's like five times the whole <laughs> movie. And there's not really even much more in the next two either. Like, uh, Empire, there's like three uses of force pull. Luke lightsabers the Wampa's arm. There's the duel in the dark side cave. Uh, he levitates the rocks. Levi- Yoda levitates the X-Wing. S- like some moments of clairvoyance. Uh, Luke Vader duel, force sense, and one use of force jump. Like, that's the most exotic power. Like, you <laughs> it's force jump. In Jedi, a couple of force jumps. He lightsabers some Jabba's baddies. He lightsabers a biker scout. He uses mind trick, force choke, levitates 3PO, uses force uh, force pull, Sith lightning, Vader, Luke, duel, force sense. That's it. In the three movies, first one, four minutes and 35 seconds of just <laughs> of force stuff. Four minutes and 56 seconds in Empire. Five minutes and 48 seconds in Jedi. The prequel trilogy across the three respective films is... Seven minutes, 14 minutes, 16 minutes. And before anyone says, well, that's because there's a ton of Jedi. Well, in the sequel trilogy, it's also 7, 7, and 16. So, yeah. The only one, the only difference there is in Last Jedi, which has, like, the least amount of actual Jedi stuff. He should have stayed in that Wampa cave. Man. I should have married the Wampa. Part Started six. New life. Man, little hideous human Wampa hybrid. Part six. Characters. I'm getting drunk. <laughs> I think this is the bread and potatoes of the original Star Wars trilogy because this is typically what people complain about with who eats bread and potato you mean bread and <laughs> meat and bread potatoes? and butter the meat and uh, the meat and the meat the, and potato the meat and bread you're mixing your the bread analogies and, the breads and the meat because <laughs> uh, especially with the prequel trilogy everyone's a wooden boring idiot and in the sequel trilogy everyone's a manic weirdo so like getting the characters right this has been like the thing I've had to put the most investigation into. Um, and eventually we'll get to our... The, the thing we I think we have agree that we like the most about Mandalorian is Carl Weathers. Carl? <laughs> Carl Weathers, wherever you are, you're a beautiful human being. Um, he's the best part of, of any... He just makes anything better. Yeah, he's, yeah, in general. But he's definitely the best part of any Disney-related Star Wars thing. Acting wise, all right. So, part six characters. I penciled in pride, consciousness of one's own dignity, because like th- th- this sort of goes into the acting style of there's some there there's like an acting style that's a little bit gone extinct or passe. So, like I said, the prequel trilogy, everyone's wooden and non-existent. Then in the sequel trilogy, they went way too far in the other direction, trying to do like this sort of Joss Whedon quippy where no one acts seriously or takes seriously their environment. Mm-hmm. So, like, in this style of acting, that largely in the 70s and 80s, this sort of presentational style of acting, where at least in Star Wars, part of that is that everyone has, like, a distinct ego. Like, they have a... You can tell their mode of existing in the world. People act... Okay, here's just a bunch of words <laughs> in the original Star Wars trilogy. Shady smarmy, mysterious, dangerous, aloof, bureaucratic, cranky. And that's a big one. A huge one. Cranky. Cranky. Everyone's everyone's just a little cranky. Yeah, they're mad about the Everyone is year. Everyone's cranky. Fucking everyone. It's the empire is just clogging up their yeah. day. Everyone yeah. is a little cranky, world weary, uh, wary and weary. Except for military officers. That's it. That's like the only exception. Everyone's a little bit standoffish, super bleh, suspicious, guarded, because they're living in a dangerous, occupied galaxy. Everyone is nervous, anxious, bossy, sassy, tenacious, forceful, eager, alert, and unsure. So that's what adds to the feeling of sadness, is that they could all die at any moment. Mm-hmm. So... Everyone's just a little cranky because they're always in these situations 
where they're just constantly in danger and acting accordingly. So getting back to the the acting style, which is hard for me to pin down, but like affected theatrical style of acting, which is a little smarmy, charismatic. There's a sense of urgency. Like they know they're playing a character and they're being more presentational about it, where it's the character they're playing takes whatever they're doing seriously, but the actor knows that they are portraying something. This, they're, they're not trying to... Like, there's no naturalistic acting involved here. That was a cool shot. Man, and I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Because, again, coming back to Carl Weathers, you want to know what it's like, obviously, than just <laughs> looking at how they act in this, but someone who the only person who's done it right is Carl Weathers. <laughs> because it, it's a little hammy. Like, not every single character. I mean, like, this pilot is just, like, an average dude. He's just kind of, whatever, I'm here, doing my sh but like he's not a supermodel. Mo That's cool. Yeah, he he's a big chunky British man doing an American accent. That's such a cool shot. This is why the snow speeders are the goddamn coolest thing. Ugh. Yeah. So again, I'm not really sure how to get more detailed than that, but it's a presentational acting. It's borderline campy. It doesn't verge into camp, but it's like it's got to hang on that borderline. It's I'm conveying an emotion. Just putting that emotion out there in a big... You're painting in big, broad strokes with the acting. Like, uh, affected, a little smarmy, charismatic, a sense of urgency, a little cranky, weary, wary, but everyone has kind of a noble presence, which goes back to the idea of pride, the consciousness of one's own thing. Um, uh, moody and a sense of wide-eyed wonder about your environment, but you don't call attention. So it's the balance of having a sense of wide-eyed wonder, but still acting like you've seen the things that exist in this fictional universe. Character mood should be directly proportionate to circumstances. So when nothing's happening, people generally act dull and moody. But when a thing happens, they get panicky and cranky. <laughs> There shouldn't be constant overlap of where, like, this fucking sequel trilogy, where everyone's just acting like a manic asshole the whole time. This is one of yours. Living action figures. Not emotionally disturbed or manic weirdos or cardboard cutouts. And there should be a clarity of delivery where you're not doing the Joss Whedon thing of talking over each other or, like, mumbling lines or, like, <clears throat> that, that thing. Yeah. There should be a clarity of delivery. Yeah, because people are over it in Star Wars. They're <laughs> just over it. <laughs> and they're stoned. <laughs> oh, I love this General Rykan. See, look at him. He's the, he's the perfect gruff. Okay, sorry Disney, but Star Wars needs old white guys. Crusty, meat-faced old only, white guys. It's the only time where old white guys are very needed. See... There is a woman in the scene, and she's a secretary. She's somewhere in this shot. I don't know. Uh, okay, the main group. Uh, Han, Luke, Leia, and... Uh, oh, there she is. She turned... What? Did that have something to do with me? They've like, got cool no. coats. Their coats are cool. I know. Cool. Like, oh, I want yeah. their 70s jackets. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't know if I... I think I said it. With, with the costume design, like, actual padding on shit. My God. Uh, do not let fashion designers make <laughs> costumes. Because, <laughs> like, there's no padding on anything. Ugh, God, in the sequel trilogy, there's just no padding. It's all just, like, superfluous, hideous details that, j that are just distracting. Like, this all feels functional. Yeah, I've never watched the original trilogy and just noticed a bunch of Cause it shouldn't. Uh, it should be. Fashion. It should be cool. It should be interesting, but like you shouldn't be noticing costumes, like or sound is, yeah. or sound design, or really in, like nothing should really be standing out, other than if it's purposeful. Like here comes the executor, executor. Like okay, that's cool. They're showcasing a thing, but that's part of the lived-in world. Is like there shouldn't be distracting elements. Oh my god. There we're okay. So the main group, their general dynamic: Han, Luke, Leia, Lando. Um, Camaraderie, ball busting, the comic relief comes from conflicting egos, and a dash of ham. 
the main group doesn't really even get along a lot of the time. Yes, they have their sentimental moments, but again, there's where contrast comes back into play. You notice those sentimental moments because they're fighting most of the time. Leia's bitchy, Han's bitchy, Luke can be bitchy, especially in the first one. Uh, situational panic. General Viz. Oh, I love this part when he just. <laughs> why, why was he standing like right behind him? That's too close. You don't stand that close to Darth Vader. <laughs> I love this guy. <laughs> Uh, Lando and Han are Lando and Han are the archetypal rogue. They're always in a little over their heads and trying to present like they are know what they're doing and are in control. Aliens should act like fucking space aliens. Yay, that's that. Weird creatures. Um, here's where it gets a little shady. I, I I don't. I'm not sure where to put the line because like whether it should all be humanoid aliens. Because it starts to get weird. I mean, like, Yoda's fine. And Jabba's fine. But, like, a lot of the smaller puppets start to become distracting and weird in Jedi. So I think just keep it mostly to humanoid. Like Jabba's little pet or whatever. Right. Salacious Crumb should have been deleted from... We don't he didn't need to be there. We don't need Jim Henson. Like as much as I love Max Rebo, didn't need to be there. Uh, <laughs> Max Rebo. So really, just keep it to humanoid aliens who act like aliens, and I'm talking specifically to the TV uh, Mando. Oh God, I love the exec here. Oh yeah, here's another su- uh, subtle world building. Obviously, when the next time he comes in, when he has his helmet off. Yeah, that's cool. Invaders, little coolish. Vader's uh, meditation One of the best scenes. Or whatever. There's, uh, what's his name from Last Crusade? He says, truly, this is the cup of cry. Th- uh, this is the cup of a king. Oh, right. You chose unwisely. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Aliens. All aliens should act like aliens. Please. Mandalorian and Boba Fett shows. Stop making alien species just talk like whatever comedian they cast in that role. They talk like never, a never, YouTuber from Earth Yeah, never sp- this ne- time. Never speak English. Aliens should not be speaking English. Yeah. They should just be f***ing aliens. If, the, if they even have to talk. Intelligent English-speaking aliens is Star Trek. Like, just... They, they, they should be side characters, like, 90% of the time. Like, not even side characters. They, like, just... Just set dressing. Uh, Soldiers slash pilots are protocol and banter machines. Uh, Background characters. They go about their f***ing business and they don't stand around mugging for the camera like cosplayers. (laughs) This is the only time where that sort of happens. But this is for a purposeful scene. Like the one huddle scene before the Empire arrives. Droids, specifically R2 and 3PO, provide punctuation to scenes. They act as surrogates for the Rebellion's ingenuity and anxiety. And and George Lucas has talked about it many, many times of like, R2 and 3PO are kind of the key to this. uh." (laughs) But I think what he means, he he described him as like like a a Greek chorus. I don't don't know what he really means by that. But but I, I think what it means is that like the dynamic between R2 and 3PO is sort of sassy and high anxiety and quippy. So that the main f***ing characters don't have to engage in tension-breaking behavior. Yeah. Like they do in the sequel trilogy. You have robots do that for you so that your main characters don't have to act like assholes. Oh, uh, Imperials, the Empire, the only movie that got them right was Rogue One. Fantastic job. Uh, what's his name? <sighs> the Empire are not foaming at the mouth space Nazis. They're a soulless bureaucratic control mechanism. Yeah, they don't, they don't seem to care that much. No. The only Imperial officer who who gets, like, angry is the one that Vader chokes in the first Star Wars film. Mm-hmm. The one in that little board meeting. Uh, what's he say? Like, uh, he hasn't provided you the clairvoyance to find the stolen battle. Pl- uh, your, your devotion to the sad religion has not helped you conjure. <laughs> Right, so the one the one imperial officer who displays emotion gets his ass choked, 
and this helps provide a contrast for the Emperor as the ultimate evil when he finally shows up. God, yeah, the Battle of Hoth is the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. I don't know why. Snow is cool. Um, AT-ATs are just really cool. The slow impending doom of, like... Like the the zombies, the slow moving zombies. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, the scene just had it. It just it just did it. Know. Well, this this goes back to production design, but I just want to discuss just the mountain mountain of difference between the original ATATs and those uh, gorilla ATATs in Last Jedi. Mm. Like that that is a case of just egregious over design. That's everything in the sequel trilogy. Is they they just took they they took everything from the originals as the basis, and then just added more crap on top of them mm -hmm. that didn't need to be there. And then on top of that, it looks even worse because it's not a physical model. Oh god. Okay. Part six. Oh wait. Here's another quote. Uh, stop motion is cool too. Oh wait. No, this isn't a quote. Yes. Stop motion. I just put reaction characters in quotations. For some... Oh. What? Oh, uh, something about reaction characters in the original trilogy. Oh, the whole thing about, like, the fish out of water, someone who can... Uh, so so that not everyone is just dryly, like, I already live here, you know, the classic fish out of water who helps exp ser audience surrogate. But, like, Luke keeps that to a extreme minimum. The droids... I don't know what I was going for this. I'm editing this part out. No, he he was a fish out of water at first. They didn't want to make that the whole plot. Yeah. Really. So so it introduces you because you don't need a fish out of water character the whole saga. Yeah. yeah. So, like the droids are the externalized comic relief in the prequel trilogy. You have Kid Anakin and Jar Jar, but like Kid Anakin doesn't really realistically ever react to his environment, and Jar neither does Jar Jar. In the sequel trilogy, everyone's a reaction... Oh, this is what I was going for. Because in the sequel trilogy, everyone's a reaction character. Mm -hmm. Like, they're constantly amazed by everything that's happening yeah. to their situation. All right, here's the last little part of part six. The Empire are stoic, improper... Oh, yeah, I already said this. The Emperor and that one cranky moth at the board meeting are the only ones who emote in the Empire. Oh, boy. Hour and 43. We're making good time. <laughs> We're almost done. Where's Beer your, number four. Where's your NyQuil? <laughs> Part seven. Music slash sound. There's your ATSD. You just walked by. Oh, those cool... Yeah, they're sweet Those vets. cool snow, snow oh, guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's another subtle world building. They Like, yeah, the the AT, -AT pilots and... The, the the snow troopers, I always loved the snow troopers. They just didn't explain they it. They didn't they didn't make a big deal about it. They just showed them, and that's it. And <clears throat> let me just reiterate: the plastic clunk is so important. Things should just look, you know, real realistic, quote unquote. But like lots of detail, but like physical plastic detail. It should look like you can touch it. It should look like a, like a thing that you can touch. Yeah, it looks like you could touch it. It looks like, like a... It all old... looks tangible. Like, just build everything. Make everything out of fucking plastic and models. Models and plastic. That's what I'm retitling this as. This models and plastic and smarm. Model, plastic, and smarm is it's... the new title of, of my rant. And put some dirt on it. And put some... Yeah. <laughs> sweat. Sweat and plastic. <laughs> oh, I love you, Han. <laughs> Music and sound. Uh, number one, mic the f***ing set. Mic it. Mic everything. I, I want to hear the clunks of plastic. Just stuff. Stuff on the set. Just mic it. Star Wars is a cavalcade of noises. Nearly everything has a distinct, unique sound. Just constant noises. Ben Burt, golden, like golden God. Like today. The, the, like today's society. That we don't yeah. really notice. <laughs> ben Burt was a... Is, I guess, and he's still alive. Hi, Ben Burt. Just a 
fucking genius, like the world's greatest ears. He just knew how to make everything sound weird, the exotic. Sound, sound designer, full ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking incredible, like the clank of the AT-ATs, the, the, the probe droid sounds, just everything. The lightsabers, just noises all the time, constant alien noises. This is something that's just vacant, vacant from Disney Star Wars. Like, the prequels are okay at it, still largely missing. Like, it's, there it is. <laughs> the one ATST <laughs> just kind of scoots by for one little brief shot. Whatever. I put sound effects are the third dimension. Their importance cannot be overstated. Make sound effects for everything. Even if it doesn't seem like it needs some a sound effect, just put a fucking sound effect on it. Like, it's the one thing where clutter is fine. Mm -hmm. Constant alien noises, bleeps and bloops, everything is clanky. Plastic clank, everything should clank. Clank. Clanks and bumps and boops. Um, wind. Wind. For the love of God, smoke and wind. Wind noises. Remember, you know how you know how we live in an environment, <laughs> and like you're constantly hearing noise and wind. Laser blast should be fucking loud. Oh, here now we're to, back to the lightsabers. Lightsaber sound. See, so yeah, I'm getting. They were so cool. I know I'm getting. I'm getting drunk and or passionate because. <laughs> I'm I'm, cl I'm clipping more often here. Anyway. <laughs> Oh, I was wondering why this is quiet, because I forgot that usually when we're podcasting, we're listening to, like, loud music mm -hmm. <laughs> and just yelling. <laughs> ah, lightsaber sound. This one's super, super f***ing important. Um, something just went missing with the lightsaber sound after the original trilogy. In the originals, there was an unnerving, lightning-esque, weird, balloon, twisty sizzle, electric sizzle to them. Yeah, like, it was unnerving. Uh, like a, 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 the crackle, that crackle cackle sound. There was a lot more dimension to the sound effect of the lightsaber mm -hmm. originally that just went missing to where now all the, all it is is just. Someone's hitting a low note on a synthesizer. Yeah, like it, it's just too. All they did was just take like the bare essence of the lightsaber sound effect. To where it still technically sounds like it, but it's still missing all of that. It's gross, because the, the the rarity grossness. of how often lightsabers met it was a big deal. With lightsabers met back then, it was a big deal, and now it's not. Yeah, way more. Uh, the electric sizzle crackle sound was way more pronounced in the OT. Music and sound effect are interlinked. They often work in tandem, and sometimes your brain just morphs the two together because, like, sometimes I can't even imagine just... It's hard to hear just the music without my brain like superimposing some of the sound effects of the scene because they just work so beautifully in tandem. John Williams, I could have just done his own sub whole subsection, but <laughs> John Williams. Um, I guess this one's a little harder because I have to just say John Williams in his prime. But just as a basic, again, this just goes back to competent filmmaking. But actually being able to hear the goddamn music. Which you can't in the sequel trilogy. It's mixed so fucking low. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even have. I wouldn't recognize it. I didn't even know there was any until rewatching it. <laughs> the prequel stuff grew on me a little bit over time because you know it's hard to beat the Imperial March and all that original trilogy stuff. But for some reason, the do 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 kind of grew on me over time. So maybe time does have. It's a good piece of music. <laughs> oh, this one's going back um, with lightsabers. There should be no music until the climax of a lightsaber duel. Almost every lightsaber duel... Uh, I thought I had a more in-depth note on this. But, uh, yeah, with lightsaber duels, it always starts off silent. And then the music kicks in at the tail end of it when it starts to peter out or, you know, the climax. The, the only exception was in um, the Return of the Jedi throne room duel where it has the qu the coral, that low coral, that ominous thing mostly throughout. That's the only time. Mm -hmm. the, the prequel trilogy is kind of 50-50 on this. Sometimes they get it right. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they wait towards the end of, of a duel to bring in music. 
And then other times it'll be just generic fanfare from beginning to end, but it's kind of hit and miss. The sequel trilogy is almost the entire time just bland, adventure fanfare over the entire fight. The only exception is Finn's portion of the lightsaber fight in Force Awakens. Um, music should be allowed to do the heavy lifting every once in a while. Like, here we are, coming up. Perfect. Uh, the Like the asteroid, the asteroid chase in Empire... It's pretty much just a showcase for John Williams' music in this whole section, <laughs> which is like the greatest piece of music he's ever written. Just absolutely chilling. The whole asteroid field piece has a beautiful arch to it and progression where it begins with the Imperial March, that big intimidating thump, and then goes into the roller coaster ride of the main brunt of the asteroid chase music, and then gently lands the plane with... Uh, Empire Strikes Back's love theme. Mwah. So beautiful. Why Why did Chewbacca just say that so precariously yeah. on the edge? I mean, How does gravity... And was he work? trying to kill him there? Yeah. Oh yeah. Passive aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> See, if that was the sequel trilogy, Ray, Ray would have caught it and thrown it back <laughs> at his head. <laughs> Oh, okay. So here, here we're getting into like the problems with the actual music. Okay, so like the the prequel trilogy, the music isn't as memorable, but like it's hard to top this. But like when you get into the sequel trilogy with John Williams, the main problem becomes inter orchestra dynamics. What I noticed listening to the soundtrack for Rise of Skywalker is it was Force Awakens, but I'm sure it applies to that film as well. Everything, the, the whole orchestra is just playing all the time. It's just a big monolith of sound. They're just jamming. Again, contrast. It's just everything's playing at the same time. I think he's mirroring the movie itself, <laughs> where there's no downtime in the movie, so he's just mirroring mirroring it with just a big flood of orchestra sound, and nothing stands out. So, like in the in the OT, he he gives the spotlight to specific sections of the orchestra. So, like you'll have like a little flute section or oboes or cellos. Like parts of it will light up. According to the situation, inter-orchestra dynamics, contrast, dynamics, rich, and that's another one is rich melody. Uh, yeah, the his sequel trilogy score is like some of his least memorable melodic work. Like, I can barely hum any of that. And earned crescendos. But again, that just goes back to dynamics and contrast. Where again, it's the white noise effect with the sequel trilogy. Yeah, this play the sequel trilogy drinking game every time I say it, <laughs> folks, folk at home who might theoretically listen to this. Yeah, high tension, sudden starts and drop offs, playful, ominous whimsy. So just the main takeaway from that is he completely lost sight of letting parts of an orchestra do some work every now and again instead of just everyone just plays. Essentially, everyone's just playing the same melodic line. All right, wrapping up. Ooh. Oh, man, they're getting the dig of a... We might get under two hours here. When I was skimming through Last Jedi today, I noticed, like, Puppet Yoda looks f***ing awful. Like, they made him cute. Like, all his proportions are, like, weirdly round, and he's, oh. like, all smiley looking. God, he, was, they... he was disgusting in the originals. <laughs> I know. His he's terrible supposed, eyes. He's supposed to be an old frog man. He's not supposed to be cute. He's cute. Be he's cute because you love him. His in retrospect, beady little eyes. But he's he's hideous. Okay, here's a quote. Uh, there, there's no real rhyme or reason to the end here. We're we're approaching the end of my rant. Uh, um, here's a quote from. I'll save that till last. That's a good quote. Um, uh, let's uh, just miscellaneous. Camera work, no low angles, and. Very little handheld, if at all. No circular movements. And really no panning at all. Like, everything's just a static shot. Okay, yeah, these are all kind of disconnected thoughts here. These, these are just things miscellaneous. Miscellany. The original trilogy was basically made by a team of scientists. Looking back in, in documentaries on the original trilogy, everyone looks like, like, yeah, there's moments of fun, but mostly people look like strung out. And overworked mm -hmm. and serious because what they were doing was really hard 
I understand like filmmaking has gotten easier, but maybe it shouldn't have. Um, because when I watch the behind the scenes stuff from the prequel trilogy, everyone looks bored and is mostly standing around. But in, in the sequel trilogy, everyone looks like weirdly just, it looks like a cocktail schmoozing party. Like a, like a Hollywood cocktail. Like, everyone's having way too much fun, yeah. but none of it translates to the screen. Like, I don't think anyone was working. Their shooting philosophy seemed to be a team of VFX artists will fill it in. Just just shoot it. And uh, so I'm not saying, like, art can't be fun, but, like, there should still be some kind of focused intensity and it's hard to really gauge just from like a documentary, but like it's sort of it's night and day, looking at how people were working between the various trilogies. Next point, the hero's journey is about seeing the wounded child behind the monster. It's about redemption, catharsis against oppression and limitation, the natural world, the human spirit versus faceless synthetic bureaucracy. Here's a. Did I have something else to say? <laughs> Where are you going? Go on. Next point. The enemy of art is the absence of limitation. That was an Orson Welles quote, a, apparently a secondhand Orson Welles quote that he may or may not have said, according to his biography. <laughs> limitations inspire creativity. Totally. That, I get that shit, man. And I think we're going to have like a whole conversation on this one. Darth Vader with that is helmet for a second. But just from the back. It it can be both. It can be like a self-imposed set of limitations or just technological limitations. But I think now that you can do anything, you have to set parameters for yourself of you're only going to do so much. Because I think, yeah, just the problem now is that you can do anything and it's like any art when you just but ha- should you <laughs> when you just have an open canvas and you you're sitting there with an open canvas. Well, an open canvas can be inspiring. I've heard that from like tons of painters and artists. Or like the most inspiring thing to me is just a blank canvas. But like, so it's not it's just a, the canvas. It's, it's like kind of a dick thing to say, really. But it's like if you're sitting there with every tool around you. If you have every tool, it becomes crippling. Mm-hmm. So if if you have immediate access to every option, then your thinking brain starts to, to turn too much. And so you start using your thinking brain to imagine a scenario instead of taking small chunks of something and finding inspiration within that small little aspect of turning something small into something totally big. Like, s- like, they had to design tiny little sets. These aren't huge sets. You had to, like, make your little frame. Yeah. You, you, the cinematographer yeah, yeah. was... You had to squeeze people into this frame because you, you couldn't build a whole planet. Yeah. You had to build this tiny thing, uh, maybe with some mirrors and some other stuff to... Yeah, exactly. You, you, you only have so much space <clears throat> that you can... Phys- and that comes back to, like, the physical environment, mostly. Or like with, or just with a matte painting, there, there's only so much that you can, you could do with that space, or that you should do, because you should still be limiting yourself to just. Here's this box. There's a limited amount of space in this box, and we have to fill it the best we can. And so you pull out all of the extra weeds and bullshit. You have this little garden, and you're just choosing the best you can, picking the cream of the crop to fill your frame with. In summary, it's about viewing scene design more as diorama or vignette than as sandbox, narrowing the scope and sharpening the focus, whether imposed by external limitations or self-imposed by artistic discipline, in order to create a specific, well-defined, and transformative slice that informs the overall bigger picture. Um, Just uh, another point was just the lost art of adventure. What is it? What is adventure? It's the the play of imagination, innocence, sincerity, mystery, and danger, which I talked about at the beginning. But like, just the sense of adventure is dead. Like, we're too cynical. And that's why this is never going to actually happen. Well, they they make they make adventure rec- uh, in more recent years about tons of crazy coincidences, and the original trilogy didn't. It wasn't coincidence heavy. But I, I think the big the big thing is sincerity. Like, 
like the the ability to like put your heart on your sleeve out there like the, the that's the romance of Star Wars is just saying this is beautiful I know like it's silly that's kind of like a lot of 80s fantasy like a lot of late 70s 80s early 90s fantasy is cuz this has like empire has a lot in common with like uh damn it what what are those other puppet movies <laughs> Not really Labyrinth, but like Dark Crystal, where there's that similar quality it, where just sincerity is dead. And that's why this is never going to happen again, because people aren't willing to be silly. Because mm-hmm. there is kind of a hokiness and a, yeah. and a silliness to this. And people always want to think that they're above it now. Like, fuck you, Ryan Johnson. Sorry, I'll edit that out. <laughs> but, like, he's the ultimate case of that. I don't think he's a bad guy, but, like, holy he really thought he was above all of this kind of thing, which is why the movie's so emotionally dead. Because he because he doesn't see the magic in this. He just sees the logic within Star Wars, like over the years, kind of collapsing in on itself and and like viewing himself as the guy who needs to fix it, instead of just enjoy the magic. You fucking piece of shit. <laughs> The end. You're going <laughs> to edit that out? No. <laughs> and the last quote, which I'm going to end on, I think I covered everything. Oh, thank God. I've been working on this for so fucking long. Two hours. Yeah. Last quote from Richard Schickel from the Making of documentary. Um, I think he had the best quote, which sums up my whole uh, outlook, philosophy, belief system on what really resonates at the core of original Star Wars and is just beautiful and timeless and is like a bright shining beacon amongst diarrhea dump of content, which is the rest of Star Wars. He says, The magic of Star Wars does not lie only in its brilliant special effects. Its power derives from something simpler and rarer, the romantic spirit that moves in it. Before it, we are all young again, and everything seems possible. God bless you, Richard (laughs) Schickel. And God bless you, George Lucas, before 1985. The end. Do you have anything to add? No, no. I'm going to go burn this notebook now. This is a good scene with uh, Han and Leia here. Tittle, <laughs> 